Beowulf from A Book of Famous Myths and Legends, Author Unknown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Pam Castile. Old King Hrothgar built for himself a great palace, covered with gold, with benches all round outside, and a terrace leading up to it. It was bigger than any hall men had ever heard of, and there Hrothgar sat on his throne to share with men the good things God had given him. A band of brave knights gathered round him, all living together in peace and joy. But there came a wicked monster, Grendel, out of the moors. He stole across the fens in the thick darkness, and touched the great iron bars of the door of the hall, which immediately sprang open. Then, with his eyes shooting out flame, he spied the knights sleeping after battle. With his steel fingernails the hideous fiend seized thirty of them in their sleep. He gave yells of joy, and sped as quick as lightning across the moors to reach his home with his prey. When the knights awoke, they raised a great cry of sorrow, whilst the aged king himself sat speechless with grief. None could do battle with the monster. He was too strong, too horrible for any one to conquer. For twelve long years, Grendel warred against Hrothgar, like a dark shadow of death he prowled round about the hall, and lay in wait for his men on the misty moors. One thing he could not touch, and that was the king's sacred throne. Now there lived in a far-off land a youngster called Beowulf, who had the strength of thirty men. He heard of the wicked deeds of Grendel, and the sorrow of the good king Hrothgar, so he had made ready a strong ship, and with fourteen friends set sail to visit Hrothgar, as he was in need of help. The good ship flew over the swelling ocean like a bird, till in due time the voyagers saw shining white cliffs before them. Then they knew their journey was at an end. They made fast their ship, grasped their weapons, and thanked God that they had had an easy voyage. Now the coast guard spied them from a tower. He set off to the shore, riding on horseback and brandishing a huge lance. "'Who are you?' he cried, bearing arms and openly landing here. "'I am bound to know from whence you come before you make a step forward. Listen to my plain words, and hasten to answer me.' Beowulf made answer that they came as friends, to rid Hrothgar of his wicked enemy Grendel and at that the coast guard led them on to guide them to the king's palace downhill they ran together with a rushing sound of voices and armed tread until they saw the hall shining like gold against the sky the guard bade them go straight to it then wheeling round on his horse he said it is time for me to go may the father of all keep you in safety for myself i must guard the coast the street was paved with stone, and Beowulf's men marched along, following it to the hall, their armor shining in the sun and clanging as they went. They reached the terrace, where they set down their broad shields. Then they seated themselves on the bench, while they stacked their spears together and made themselves known to the herald. Hrothgar speedily bade them welcome. They entered the great hall with measured tread, Beowulf leading the way. His armor shone like a golden network, and his look was high and noble, as he said, Hail, O king, to fight against Grendel single-handed have I come. Grant me this, that I may have this task alone, I and my little band of men. I know that the terrible monster despises weapons, and therefore I shall bear neither sword nor shield nor buckler. Hand to hand I will fight the foe, and death shall come to whosoever God wills. If death overtakes me, then will the monster carry away my body to the swamps. So care not for my body, but send my armor to my king. My fate is in God's hands. Hrothgar loved the youth for his noble words, and bade him and his men sit down to the table, and merrily share the feast, if they had a mind to do so. 
as they feasted a minstrel sang with a clear voice the queen in cloth of gold moved down the hall and handed the jewelled cup of mead to the king and all the warriors old and young at the right moment with gracious words she brought it to beowulf full of pride and high purpose the youth drank from the splendid cup and vowed that he would conquer the enemy or die when the sun sank in the west all the guests arose the king bade beowulf guard the house and watch for the foe have courage he said be watchful resolve on success not a wish of yours shall be left unfulfilled if you perform this mighty deed then beowulf lay down to rest in the hall putting off from him his coat of mail helmet and sword through the dim night grendel came stealing all slept in the darkness all but one the door sprang open at the first touch that the monster gave it he trod quickly over the paved floor of the hall his eyes gleamed as he saw a troop of kinsmen lying together asleep he laughed as he reckoned on sucking the life of each one before day broke he seized a sleeping warrior and in a trice that crunched his bones then he stretched out his hand to seize beowulf on his bed quickly did beowulf grip his arm he stood up full length and grappled with him with all his might till his fingers cracked as though they would burst never had grendel felt such a grip he had a mind to go but could not he roared and the hall resounded with his yells as up and down he raged with beowulf holding him in a fast embrace the benches were overturned the timbers of the hall cracked the beautiful hall was all but wrecked beowulf's men had seized their weapons and thought to hack grendel on every side but no blade could touch him still beowulf held him by the arm his shoulder cracked and he fled wounded to death leaving hand arm and shoulder in beowulf's grasp over the moors into the darkness he sped as best he might and to beowulf was the victory then in the morning many a warrior came from far and near riding in troops they tracked the monster's path where he had fled stricken to death in a dismal pool he had yielded up his life racing their horses over the green turf they reached again the paved street the golden roof of the palace glittered in the sunlight the king stood on the terrace and gave thanks to god i have had much woe he said but this lad through god's might has done the deed that we with all our wisdom could not do now i will heartily love you beowulf as if you were my son you shall want for nothing in this world and your fame shall live for ever the palace was cleansed the walls hung anew with cloth of gold the whole palace was made fair and straight for only the roof had been left altogether unhurt after the fight a merry feast was held the king brought forth out of his treasures a banner helmet and mail coat these he gave to beowulf but more wonderful than all was a famous sword handed down to him through the ages then eight horses with golden cheek-plates were brought within the court one of them was saddled with king hrothgar's own saddle decorated with silver hrothgar gave all to beowulf bidding him enjoy them well to each of beowulf's men he gave rich gifts the minstrels sang the queen beautiful and gracious bore the cup to the king and beowulf to beowulf she too gave gifts mantle and bracelets and collar of gold use these gifts she said and prosper well as far as the sea rolls your name shall be known great was the joy of all till evening came then the hall was cleared of benches and strewn with bed beowulf like the king had his own bower this night to sleep in the nobles lay down in the hall at their heads they set their shields and placed ready their helmets and their mail coats each slept ready in an instant to do battle for his lord so they sank to rest little dreaming what deep sorrow was to fall on them hrothgar's men sank to rest but death was to be the portion of one grendel the monster was dead 
Papa Grendel's mother still lived. Furious at the death of her son, she crept to the great hall and made her way in, clutched an earl, the king's dearest friend, and crushed him in his sleep. Great was the uproar, though the terror was less than when Grendel came. The knights leapt up, sword in hand. The witch hurried to escape. She wanted to get out with her life. The aged king felt bitter grief when he heard that his dearest friend was slain. He sent for Beowulf, who, like the king, had had his own sleeping bower that night. The youth stood before Hrothgar and hoped that all was well. "'Do not ask if things go well,' said the sorrowing king. "'We have fresh grief this morning. My dearest friend and noblest knight is slain. Grendel you yourself destroyed through the strength given you by God, but another monster has come to avenge his death. I have heard the country folk say that there were two huge fiends to be seen stalking over the moors, one like a woman, as near as they could make out. The other had the form of a man, but was huger far. It was he they called Grendel. These two haunt a fearful spot, a land of untrodden bogs and windy cliffs, a waterfall plunges into the blackness below, and twisted trees with gnarled roots overhang it. An unearthly fire is seen gleaming there night after night. None can tell the depth of the stream. Even a stag hunted to death will face his foes on the bank rather than plunge into those waters. It is a fearful spot. You are our only hope. Dare you enter this horrible haunt? quick was Beowulf's answer. Sorrow not, O king. Rouse yourself quickly, and let us track the monster. Each of us must look for death, and he who has the chance should do mighty deeds before it comes. I promise you, Grendel's kin shall not escape me, if she hide in the depths of the earth or of the ocean. The king sprang up gladly, and Beowulf and his friends set out. They passed stony banks and narrow gullies, the haunts of goblins. Suddenly they saw a clump of gloomy trees overhanging a dreary pool. A shudder ran through them, for the pool was blood-red. All sat down by the edge of the pool, while the horn sounded a cheerful blast. In the water were monstrous sea-snakes, and on jutting points of land were dragons and strange beasts. They tumbled away, full of rage, at the sound of the horn. One of Beowulf's men took aim at a monster with his arrow and pierced him through, so that he swam no more. Beowulf was making ready for the fight. He covered his body with armor, lest the fiend should clutch him. On his head was a white helmet, decorated with figures of boars worked in silver. No weapon could hurt it. His sword was a wonderful treasure, with an edge of iron. It had never failed any one who had needed it in battle. "'Be like a father to my men, if I perish,' said Beowulf to Hrothgar, "'and send the rich gifts you have given me to my king. He will see that I had good fortune while life lasted. Either I will win fame, or death shall take me. He dashed away, plunging headlong into the pool. It took nearly the whole day before he reached the bottom, and while he was still on his way, the water witch met him. For a hundred years she had lived in those depths. She made a grab at him and caught him in her talons, but his coat of mail saved him from her loathsome fingers. Still she clutched him tight and bore him in her arms to the bottom of the lake. He had no power to use his weapons, though he had courage enough. Water beasts swam after him and battered him with their tusks. Then he saw that he was in a vast hall where there was no water, but a strange unearthly glow of firelight. At once the fight began, but the sword would not fight. It failed its master in his need, for the first time its fame broke down. Away Beowulf threw it in anger, trusting to the strength of his hands. He cared nothing for his own life, for he thought but of honor. He seized the witch by the shoulder and swayed her so that she sank on the pavement. Quickly she recovered and closed in on him. He staggered and fell, worn out. 
she sat on him and drew her knife to take his life but his good mail coat turned the point he stood up again and then truly god helped him for he saw among the armour on the wall an old sword of huge size the handiwork of giants he seized it and smote with all his might so that the witch gave up her life his heart was full of gladness and light calm and beautiful as that of the sun filled the hall he scanned the vast chamber and saw grendel lying there dead he cut off his head as a trophy for king hrothgar whose men the fiend had killed and devoured now those men who were seated on the banks of the pool watching with hrothgar saw that the water was tinged with blood then the old men spoke together of the brave beowulf saying they feared they would never see him again the day was waning fast so they and the king went homeward beowulf's men stayed on sick at heart gazing at the pool they longed but did not expect to see their lord and master under the depths beowulf was making his way to them the magic sword melted in his hand like snow in sunshine only the hilt remained so venomous was the fiend that had been slain therewith he brought nothing more with him than the hilt and grendel's head up he rose through the waters where the furious sea beast before had chased him now not one was to be seen the depths were purified when the witch lost her life so he came to land bravely swimming bearing his spoils his men saw him they thanked god and ran to free him of his armor they rejoiced to get sight of him sound and whole now they marched gladly through the highways to the town it took four of them to carry grendel's head on they went all fourteen their captain glorious in their midst they entered the great hall startling the king and queen as they sat at meat with the fearful sight of grendel's head beowulf handed the magic hilt to hrothgar who saw that it was the work of giants of old he spake to beowulf while all held their peace praised him for his courage said that he would love him as his son and bade him be a help to mankind remembering not to glory in his own strength for he held it from god and death without more ado might subdue it altogether many many treasures he said must pass from me to you to-morrow but now rest and feast gladly beowulf sat down to the banquet and well he liked the thought of rest when day dawned he bade the king farewell with noble words promising to help him in time of need hrothgar with tears and embraces let him go giving him fresh gifts of hoarded jewels he wept for he loved beowulf well and knew he would never see him any more the coast guard saw the gallant warriors coming bade them welcome and led them to their ship the wind whistled in the sails and a pleasant humming sound was heard as the good ship sped on her way so beowulf returned home having done mighty deeds and gained great honour in due time beowulf himself became king and well he governed the land for fifty years then trouble came a slave fleeing from his master stumbled by an evil chance into the den of a dragon there he saw a dazzling hoard of gold guarded by the dragon for three hundred winters the treasure tempted him and he carried off a tankard of gold to give to his master to make peace with him the dragon had been sleeping now he awoke and sniffed the scent of an enemy along the rock he hunted diligently over the ground he wanted to find the man who had done the mischief in his sleep in his rage he swung around the treasure mound dashing it to it now and again to seek the jewel tankard he found it hard to wait until evening came when he meant to avenge with fire the loss of his treasure presently the sun sank and the dragon had his will he set forth burning all the cheerful homes of men his rage was felt far and wide before dawn he shot back again to his dark home trusting in his mound and in his craft to defend himself 
Now Beowulf heard that his own home had been burnt to the ground. It was a great grief to him, almost making him break out in a rage against Providence. His breast heaved with anger. He meant to rid his country of the plague and to fight the dragon single-handed. He would have thought it shame to seek him with the large band, he who, as a lad, had killed Grendel and his kin. As he armed for the fray, many thoughts filled his mind. He remembered the days of his youth and manhood. I fought many wars in my youth, he said, and now that I am aged and the keeper of my people, I will yet again seek the enemy and do famously. He bade his men await him on the mountain side. They were to see which of the two would come out alive out of the tussle. There the aged king beheld where a rocky archway stood, with a stream of fire gushing from it. No one could stand there and not be scorched. He gave a great shout, and the dragon answered with a hot breath of flame. Beowulf, with drawn sword, stood well up to his shield, when the burning dragon, curved like an arch, came headlong upon him. The shield saved him but little. He swung up the sword to smite the horrible monster, but its edge did not bite. Sparks flew around him on every side. He saw that the end of his days had come. His men crept away to the woods to save their lives. One and only one, Wiglaf by name, sped through the smoke and flame to help his lord. "'My lord Beowulf!' he cried. With all your might defend life, I will support you to the utmost. The dragon came on in fury. In a trice the flames consumed Wiglaf's shield. But nothing daunted, he stepped under the shelter of Beowulf's, as his own fell in ashes about him. The king remembered his strength of old, and he smote with his sword with such force that it stuck in the monster's head, while splinters flew all around. His hand was so strong that, as men used to say, he broke any sword using it, and was none the worse for it. Now for the third time the dragon rushed upon him, and seized him by the neck with his poisonous fangs. Wiglaf, with no thought for himself, rushed forward, though he was scorched with the flames, and smote the dragon lower down than Beowulf had done. With such effect the sword entered the dragon's body, that from that moment the fire began to cease. The king, recovering his senses, drew his knife, and ended the monster's life. So these two together destroyed the enemy of the people. To Beowulf that was the greatest moment of his life, when he saw his work completed. The wound that the dragon had given him began to burn and swell, for the poison had entered it. He knew that the tale of his days was told. As he rested on a stone by the mound, he pondered thoughtfully, looking on the cunning work of the dwarves of old, the stone arches on their rocky pillars. Wiglaf, with tender care, unloosed his helmet and brought him water, Beowulf discoursing the while. Now I would gladly have given my armor to my son, had God granted me one. I have ruled this people fifty years, and no king has dared attack them. I have held my own with justice, and no friend has lost his life through me. Though I am sick with deadly wounds, I have comfort in this. Now go quickly, beloved Woodlaf, show me the ancient wealth that I have won from my people, the gold and brilliant gems that I may then contently give up my life. Quickly did Wiglaf enter the mound at the bidding of his master. On every side he saw gold and jewels and choice vases, helmets and bracelets, and overhead a marvellous banner, all golden, gleaming with light, so that he could scan the surface of the floor and see the curious treasured hoards. He filled his lap full of golden cups and platters, and also took the brilliant banner. He hastened to return with his spoils, wondering with pain if he should find his king still alive. He bore his treasures to him, laid them on the ground, and again sprinkled him with water. "'I thank God,' said the dying king, "'that I have been permitted to win this treasure from my people. Now they will have all that they need. 
but I cannot be any longer here. Bid my men make a lofty mound on the headland overlooking the sea, and there place my ashes. In time to come men shall call it Beowulf's Barrow. It shall tower aloft to guide sailors over the stormy seas. The brave king took from his neck his golden collar, took his helmet and his coronet, and gave them to his true knight, Wiglaf. Fate has swept all my kinsmen away, said he, and now I must follow them. That was his last word, as his soul departed from his bosom to join the company of the just. Of all kings in the world he was, said his men, the gentlest to his knights, and the most desirous of honour. End of Beowulf From a Book of Famous Myths and Legends Author Unknown